the building was designed just as a place for people to stay in the national park so that they could go out and experience Grand Teton National Park, um, whether through fishing or rafting and horseback rides and ways for people to get out into the national park. There were no TVs in the rooms. There's still no TVs in the rooms here because you're not supposed to be staying in the rooms. You're supposed to be going out and experiencing the park, whether you're out actually in the wilderness or you're in the main lobby looking at the view. After World War II, a lot of people were coming to national parks. They were so happy that rationing was over and the soldiers were home and wanted to see their country. And the parks really were not equipped for meeting the hordes of people who were coming. And so Mission 66 was devised that by 1966, there would be safe, and adequate facilities for the great numbers of people who were coming. Jackson Lake Lodge was really a precursor to the Mission 66 program, which began in 1956, so a year after Jackson Lake Lodge opened. Mission 66, as, as Mary pointed out, was meant to modernize the national parks. Jackson Lake Lodge being right before that, um, it really ties in with those past lodges and that it's a lodge with these outskirt cabins. So I think in that sense, Jackson Lake Lodge is really the last great rustic lodge, but it also is a bridge into what was to come in Mission 66. The Rockefellers were willing to finance the building of Jackson Lake Lodge. They wanted to make it so that the American public could afford to stay. It did become possible for some of the middle class people to use this. Uh, you know, I think people thought that Rockefeller was crazy to build a lodge that was only open three months out of the year. There was no way that was going to be financially viable. And he was insistent that it was a gift to the American public. And it was really the capstone of his big projects here in the Teton area. He purchased so much land that he donated to the Park Service and preserved. And he didn't intend to build a grand lodge. Uh, that was really something that came out of his preservation work. The Jackson Lake Lodge is really a kind of populist version of modernism. It incorporates aspects of the arts and crafts nature of the earlier national park buildings, but it is still a modern building. It has a very linear influence. Some of it could be called a bit of prairie style of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, but this architect, Gilbert Stanley Underwood, was able to incorporate aspects of traditional work along with these new modern ideas. Jackson Lake Lodge was designed really to take the most advantage of this site without intruding on the site. And I think that's the key to looking at the design, is that the mountains behind it are very tall and jagged, but the site we're actually on is very flat. We're on a bench above Willow Flats here, and the site is, I think he described it as billiard table flat. And so the building and these blocks are long horizontals and the building's supposed to sink into that landscape so that it's not part of the landscape. One of the remarkable things about this building is the approach, the way it lives in the landscape. When you approach the building from getting out of a car, you're in a really dense landscape. The building is almost entirely obscured. And as you approach, the story unfolds of what this building and this entry sequence is about. The Port Cochere is a very low space and it sets up the contrast as we walk through this building. The building is a kind of filter from the east side, which is one aspect of nature. It's cooler, it's tree covered, and we will see as it unfolds the impact of the other side of the building. When you approach the building, uh, you don't see it because of all the landscaping, and that was very intentional. Um, when you look at the building from the other side, say over from the dam, you don't see the building either because it just is part of this bench. Now we're in the entry vestibule of the hotel. This is a bit of a holding area before 
you rise up to the grand lounge space that we will proceed to. In this idea of a sequence of entry, as an architect practicing in this environment, I can't overstress the importance of the lesson of what this presents, how you enter a building, how you reveal nature. The stairs that Underwood designed, he designed with purpose of forethought. His mode of operation was when possible, he would bring people into a rather unprepossessing area, such as our lower lobby. And then he would lead people up and they went up this narrow staircase and my goodness at the top of the staircase they burst into a magnificent view of this upper lobby and through the windows of the mountains. The architect that had designed this building really did thoroughly think about it from every aspect. He planted the parking lot so that it eventually would be tree covered and diminish and obscure the approach to the building. He left the west side very visible, but he also gave glimpses of the building and I think thought through very carefully so many aspects of this and took so seriously the intentions of the Rockefellers in making this building respect the landscape. When the lodge opened, there was a horrible reaction to it. People, people thought it did not fit in the National Park. They didn't know why Underwood had designed this uh, for Grand Teton, and they just didn't think it was appropriate. These buildings take a while for people to warm up to them. I think there probably are still people that wouldn't choose this kind of architecture, would do a more traditional building. But I want to reinforce the importance to architecture as a discipline and to our culture in general about options and choices and about the relationship of a building with the time in which it's created. And I'm not talking about buildings that are trendy. I'm talking about buildings that work with and consider methods of construction and other real considerations of site and program. What's happening in the building? How are people going to use it? And work with progressive ideas. Ethan Carr talks a lot in his book on Mission 66 about how the Park Service has always had the same goal in designing in the wilderness or in national parks, and that is to design uh, buildings that harmonize with the landscape. But what really changes between the 1920s and the 1950s is what we mean by harmonize. And in the 1920s, we're looking at buildings that help frame the view and are part of the landscape. And those beautiful rustic buildings with their natural materials do just that. It's a lot like taking a photo out at Mormon Row or something where you have the building in your frame. Here at Jackson Lake Lodge, the building wasn't supposed to be part of your view. It was just supposed to be really a means to an end to experience the national park and the view here. No building is perfect, and there are things that are certainly not perfect about the building, but it is an important building in this region, and it's an important building to the national treasure of buildings. There's a lot that lends itself to this landscape and to this location, and I, I think it's more about understanding the, the 1950s and uh, the changes going on in the United States and in national parks that uh, really makes this building interesting. I do have a strong feeling that the integrity of this building makes it interesting when it was built and going forward into the future because it is more functional than something that was created at that time to mimic something that was created before it.